Un train, un arbre, deux réseaux, deux odyssées. This is how Colson Whitehead's The Underground Railroad and Richard Powers' The Overstory are linked by their translator Serge Chauvin in a text he wrote about translating both masterpieces into French. Tonight we will be part of these odysseys. Writer, translator, and events manager of Shakespeare and Company, Adam Biles, will take us on a trip when interviewing Colson Whitehead during the first part of this evening. And then writer, journalist, and TV anchor Annelies Beck will speak with Richard Powers. It is a true privilege to welcome both authors here in Brussels. With Richard Powers, it's a happy reunion, since he stayed in Brussels in 2005 as a writer in residence of the International House of Literature, Passaporta. For Colson Whitehead, it's a privileged acquaintance. Both authors have received extensive awards for their work by prestigious professional juries and institutions. But perhaps one of the most significant appreciations comes from their translator, Serge Chauvin, who testifies of being deeply and personally touched during the translations of these two challenging books. For him, translating was une traversée exigeante, mais portée par le souffle de la langue, autant que par une identification empathique au personnage. Besides the brilliant style and composition, a sublime command of language, and an urgent thematic choice that is typical for both the Underground Railroad and the Overstory, the empathy for the characters is also something that characterizes these books par excellence. Books and writers started their journey in the United States and traveled to Europe at the invitation of the Biennial Festival America, which takes place this weekend in Vincennes near Paris. More than 70 authors gather there to talk about their work and the world during a hundred or so literary meetings. For the second time already, festival director Francis Geffard invited International House of Literature Passaporta and arts venue Flagey to co-organize a prelude in Brussels. From Geffard's generous list, we chose tonight's special guests. After Brussels and Paris, this year's Festival America will also travel to London. But first, Brussels. On behalf of Festival America, Flaget and Passaporta, I wish you all an inspiring evening. Besides these partners, I would also like to thank the French publishers Albert Michel and Cherche Midi, in supporting this event with their writers, Colson Whitehead and Richard Powers. Both gentlemen will be interviewed consecutively. There's no break or Q&A, but afterwards you can address the writers personally during the book signing. Passaporta Bookshop has a book stand where you can buy the books of the writers, as well as a French translation, Défense de nourrir les vieux, by Adam Biles. And Colson Whitehead, Colson Whitehead will sign his book, but Richard Powers prefers to sign on a separate card, which, is, which will also be provided. Translator Serge Chauvin is here with us tonight as well. The text he wrote for at the occasion of Festival America Brussels can be read on passaporta.be. Je vous souhaite une très belle soirée. Ik wens u een bijzonder inspirerende avond toe. Please welcome Adam Biles and Colson Whitehead. Thank you. Um, it's a real privilege for me to be here tonight to be able uh, to participate in this conversation with Colston Whitehead. I've come up from Paris uh, specifically for this evening. Um, normally I can be found curating and introducing the events at Shakespeare and Company bookstore um, just in front of uh, Notre Dame Cathedral, but I'm delighted to be in Brussels tonight. Colston Whitehead's sixth novel tells the story of Cora who escapes from the bonds of slavery on a Georgian cotton plantation with the assistance of the Underground Railroad, a network which, in Colson Whitehead's retelling, assumes a physical form, complete with buried stations, steam-powered locomotives, and courageous guards. As Cora progresses from state to state, however, she has cause to reassess what form her hard-won freedom might actually take and question whether the bonds of slavery can ever be truly thrown off. The Underground Railroad is not only a searing critique of historical slavery, it also confronts the daily terrors and mutating threats faced by black people in America from the antebellum era right up to the present day. 
With its ingenious conception, its political charge, its virtuoso genre bending, and its nods to Swift, The Underground Railroad is a novel that only Colson Whitehead could have written. And thank goodness he did. For with every day that passes, with every renewed power grab by the forces of white supremacy, this moving and fiercely moral work feels ever more essential. In addition to The Underground Railroad, Colson Whitehead is the author of the novels Zone One, Sag Harbor, The Intuitionist, John Henry Days, and Apex Hides the Hurt, and the nonfiction The Colossus of New York and The Noble Hustle. The Underground Railroad won the Perlitzer Prize for Fiction, the National Book Award for Fiction, the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence, and the Arthur C. Clarke Award. I think I've listed them all, but there's possibly more. Um, the Guardian called The Underground Railroad luminous, furious, and wildly inventive, and the New York Times described it as a story essential to our understanding of the American past and the American present. While President Barack Obama, selecting The Underground Railroad as one of his favorite books of the year, simply held it as terrific. Please join me in welcoming Colson Whitehead. Howdy. Thanks so much for having me and for all you nice folks for coming out. Um, very delighted to be here to start the festival. And um, I'm very lucky to meet Richard Powers, who's been an idol of mine for decades. Usually you meet a writer you admire, and uh, afterwards you're like, Kind of a jerk. Um, <laughs> and, and with Richard Powers, like, he's a pretty cool guy. So it's been a very lovely day so far. So however the evening turns out, you know, it's, it's good yes, for you. there's that. It's a win already. Um, I, I guess I'd like to begin the conversation. I mean, I guess it's a banal thing to say, but at the beginning. Um, because while a lot of the talk about the Underground Railroad is about Cora's journey once she, once she escapes from the plantation, the different... Uh, sort of iterations of American society, American oppression that she meets. One thing that's very striking, or at least was striking for me when I, when I read the book, was how much time you spend on the plantation to begin with and how much time and care you spend giving us a, a view of life. Um, on the plantation. Um, and I just wondered, first of all, in the, in the process of researching it, how, how difficult was it for you to, to think yourself back onto that, on no, yeah, sure. I mean, there are a few things there. Um, in my book, the Underground Railroad is a literal railroad, not, uh, not a metaphor. And then each state that Cora goes through is a different state of American possibility. Um, so there's a white supremacist state, there's a black utopia state. Um, and, I, and I had that, that, that scheme sort of early on. Um, I had the idea for the book many years ago, and then it's one thing to have the idea to do it and then to do the research. And uh, I sort of realized that before I started bringing in the fantastic parts, a literal railroad and various other things, um, I felt a duty to get it right. And so Georgia, the first chapter, is a, um, hopefully a realistic plant, uh, depiction of a plantation, a cotton plantation. And uh, I think in doing the research, I felt I had a duty to testify for my nameless ancestors who went through slavery, somehow survived to have a child, uh, who grew up to have children, and eventually I'm here, uh, confronting, that, confronting that kind of existential dilemma. And then um, since I do deform history and move things around, uh, I wanted to get it right. And so hopefully Georgia stands up as a, as a realistic depiction. And, and one of the things that struck me about the way in which the plantation was uh, presented as well, compared to perhaps how we're more accustomed to seeing a, a cotton plantation predict, uh, presented, is that the, the, the center of life, as you presented, is the life amongst the slaves. Like this, often, often I feel it's presented in film and literature where you have the, the, the house, the, the owners of the plantation, and everything seems to kind of gravitate around that. Whereas that's not what we find in the Underground Railroad. There's this kind of, the, the dynamic is amongst the, the slaves and the sort of the, the slave owners, they, they make, you know, uh, incursions and very sort of violent incursions but there's this uh, we really get a sense of the sort of the dynamic and the community that existed uh, between slaves themselves and it really struck me that that is something which is not often presented when people are writing or making art about about slavery often it's this sort of the the slaves presented broadly as a kind of homogenous group whereas in fact the the group that you present us with in, in the Georgia chapter are by no means homogenous. It has its own hierarchies and its own dynamics. No, sure. I mean, I, I think growing up, whenever 
you know, I saw some film with slavery in it. There's a uh, hundred person plantation, hundred persons, hundred group, a uh, slave quarter of hundred slaves, and maybe there's one Uncle Tom who's informing for the master, but everyone else is helping each other. And uh, perhaps it speaks dimly of my view of humanity, but that's not how a hundred people would act under those conditions. I think if you have a hundred people in a room, a hundred folks in a room, 10 are great, 10 are terrible, and most of us sort of migrate in between. If you have people who've been dehumanized, brutalized, um, uh, tortured uh, since birth, uh, from what we know about trauma and post-traumatic stress, um, we're not gonna have that, that one Uncle Tom. I think we lose the, the sort of top 10 and the, uh, the terrible people will get much bigger. And so, in order, writing in 2015, to have a psychologically credible plantation for me, uh, that meant that people are trying to survive for every little piece of food, um, bit of shelter. Um, uh, they don't treat each other kindly because they've, they've had their psychologies deformed by the, by the uh, consequences of slavery. Um, that means, like, there's a, a cabin called the Hob Cabin, where they send the outcasts, uh, the misfits. What do we do with our mentally impaired, the people who won't fit? We cast them aside, put them in asylums. And so I was trying to replicate um, our modern societal mm -hmm. structures inside the plantation. And in doing so, it does, it does have the effect, I think, on the reader of kind of increasingly rehumanizing the the presentation of slaves as well i mean it's a sort of the slaves were obviously dehumanized by their condition but i think have also been dehumanized in the way that they're presented in art and so if you present a group of people as broadly homo homogenous then you're denying the the complexity and the nuance to their their experience and one thing in in giving us this this community there is a sense of sort of rehumanizing and re yeah, well i think in the same way i'm rejecting uh, the hollywood depiction of a plantation uh, of everyone helping each other, uh, unfortunately. I'm also rejecting, you know, Gone with the Wind. Mm -hmm. This is not a story about slavery, but it's not about a, a white lady being self-actualized against the backdrop of slavery. You know, oh, they burned down my house. Like, good, they should burn down your house. Mm -hmm. You traffic in human flesh. <laughs> Let's talk um, about Cora, because obviously Cora is the principal protagonist and the, really the, the backbone um, of the book. Um, so, so two things, I guess, um, about Cora is that she was born on the plantation, first of all, which ov obviously, I guess, when you're, when, you, when you're writing about the, the experience of, of being a slave in the American South, there's, um, there can be two distinct experiences. There can be the one of the, like, the slave kidnapped from Middle Africa. Passage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and also, of course, the decision, I guess, not taken lightly and clearly taken uh, with a reason to may have a principal protagonist as... Uh, as a woman as well. And I was just wondering what, what informed that decision to make your, to make your, to give your book a heroine? Well, I, I wanted the book to take place after the um, implementation of the Fugitive Slave Act, which is around 1848, 1850. And the Fugitive Slave Act meant that um, you could have escaped from your master 30 years before, moved to Massachusetts, a free state, start a new life, and now, um, According to this new law, your master could retrieve you, your stole property, even if you've been away for 30 years. Um, and that changed the, the dynamic of, of what freedom meant. Uh, no matter how long uh, you'd been away from the place you'd escaped, you could still be retrieved by a slave catcher. Um, so that meant that uh, she's probably born on the plantation. And then um, picking a female protagonist, there, there are many reasons, some practical. Um, uh, I never had a mother-daughter dynamic before, and so I always try to do different things, and so that was worth exploring. In the years that I had the book in the back of my head, the um, protagonist was a man running away, a husband looking for a, a, a spouse who'd been sold off to a different plantation, and then I finally hit upon uh, the mother-daughter thing. Um, there's a very famous slave narrative that stayed with me from college, written by Harriet Jacobs, and um, she was on a plantation, uh, ran away, hid in an attic for seven years before she got passage to the north. And she writes very movingly about the dilemma of the female slave. Um, when a, 
a slave girl becomes a slave woman. She enters into a, a new, more terrible form of slavery. Uh, she's now subject to her master's sexual desires if she wasn't already. She's supposed to pump out babies because more babies means more slaves, more property, more money. And it's a different situation that faced the male slaves, and that just seemed worthy of, of taking up. And then, um, then on a practical level, I had a string of male protagonists in a row, and so a, a voice in the back of my head was saying, don't do the same crap all the time, Colson. People will catch on to your tricks. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> And, and once you, once this idea of, of Cora as a character developed, did, was it a character that came to you relatively fully formed? Did it take you a long time to, to get to know her? And was that through, through the writing? Or I'm, I'm curious about how her Yeah, I mean, developed. I think um, I do a lot of outlining before I start. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just the way I work, figuring out the structure, uh, the beginning and the end, the middle can, can be fuzzy. I know there's some writers who are like, oh, I just you know, sit down and the muse comes and, and tells me things and moves my hand. <laughs> uh, I sort of have to have an assignment each day. You know, describe Cora, describe the cabin. Um, and in, in, this, in this case, so I knew the plot and then I started writing and I have to sort of figure out how Cora walks and talks. And I think early on in that Georgia section, uh, there are two moments that sort of defined her for me. I mean, I've been living with her for a while, and I know what she's going to do on page 200, but I don't know how she actually speaks. And I think the two moments that sort of defined her for me are when she takes back uh, a plot of a small garden from a bully who's taken it from her, uh, a, uh, an older boy named Blake, and she stands up to him, which is sort of unexpected for a 10-year-old uh, girl to assert her rights on this plantation. Um, and then she protects a, another uh, orphan, a uh, kid without uh, any family in a plantation, from being beaten. And she's, you know, she's seen people be beaten before. She's seen people strung up and, and killed. Uh, but something moves her to protect um, Chester from, from being beaten. And I, I think once I had those two moments, and I think in the first 30 pages, I sort of knew how she would react when Ridgeway the slave catcher meets her, how she would act um, on the Valentine plantation. So um, I knew who she was um, in a certain way, but it wasn't until I uh, sort of figured out those two moments that I knew who she really was. And of course, it's the second of those moments which sort of, which precipitates her, her escape from the plantation, her sort of, her, her, her position almost become, yeah, becomes untenable. Like this sort of, there, there is a moment that it sort of, Either she escapes, or you know, her, her life will most will likely be cut short. There's sort of something um, that makes it difficult, increasingly difficult for her to be there. And so she 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 escapes along with uh, Caesar, and they they head into the underground railroad. Now, you, you mentioned at the beginning that uh, your conception of the underground railroad is obviously a spin on the on the historical conception. You you make it physical. You you, act, you, know, it, you, you actually create literal tunnels and trains and things like that. And I'm curious about, as a, as a writer, why, the, why you felt the need to do that. Like, what, what, what liberty it gave you with the story, with the plotting, with the way you wanted to write the book, that cleaving closer to the, the, the literal history of the Underground Railroad would have done. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the genesis of the book is fantastic. You know, what if I make the metaphor into a literal train? If you're not acquainted with what the Underground Railroad was, it was a, a human network of people who would help slaves escape from the slave states to the north, and you might uh, hide them in your, in your boat and take them up, up, up the Atlantic coast in your, your wagon, hand them off to somebody else. Um, and I guess in the 1840s, the railroad was transforming America. It was a very vivid image of the railroad. And um, I guess the story goes that a slave master woke up, found that one of his slaves had miss was missing, and uh, he said, it's as if she disappeared on an underground railroad. And that became the term for this human network. Um, but really, I, I was just sort of sitting on my couch in a depressive stupor, probably. And... Um, came across a reference to the railroad and thought, well, what if I made it into a literal train? Because uh, when a lot of kids, a lot of kids, when they first hear about it, they think it's a literal railroad. So um, from its very conception, it's fantastic, which 
and it's not a realistic story of a slave running north. And so that early decision makes, I think, a lot of the, the novel possible. Um, I mentioned Harry Jacobs, who hid in an attic, you think hiding in an attic, and Frank, and that sort of slippage um, allowed me to make my white supremacist state in North Carolina. How can I take the story of, that's partially about the oppression of black people in America and open up the oppression of Jewish people in Europe in the 30s and 40s? Um, the Nazis took American ideas about scientific racism, eugenics, racial purity, uh, the racial codes of the Jim Crow South, lynching culture, and took, them, and took these American ideas to the logical extreme, which was the Holocaust. And so um, uh, if I'd stuck to a, the facts, I couldn't have this sort of play with history, recombining uh, different elements of uh, American history, but also world history, to create a new narrative. And I guess my idea, my, my, my motto early on was that, was that I wouldn't stick to the facts, but I would stick to the truth. Mm -hmm. And so each stop that, each time Cora comes up from the tunnel, she in a, she's in a different alternative America. And, and obviously I could not have that in a realistic story. I, I mentioned in the introduction um, what, I, what I perceived as sort of nods to, to Swift. Uh, and, there is a, and there's a moment as well where um, Caesar, if I remember rightly, is reading Gulliver's Travels. Um, and of course, this idea of Cora going underground and re-emerging in a different land run by different principles does make us, well, it does, does echo uh, what Swift was doing with Gulliver's Travels. Was that a, a sort of a, a, a text that you kind of kept at the back of your mind as you were writing? Um, you know, sort of weirdly not. I mean, I think uh, uh, I would tell my friends I had this idea for many years and I would say, and then each state is an alternative America. And they would say, that sounds really stupid, Colson. And then I started <laughs> saying, um, like Gulliver's Travels, and they're like, oh, I get it now. And so it became a, a shorthand uh, to describe the structure of the book. Um, you know, for me, you know, I, I think of The Odyssey and, and Pilgrim's Progress, which I read in, in high school. Um, uh, and so also the structure for Gulliver's Travels, where a hero is going on a series of allegorical adventures, and um, he or she solves the problem of one chapter, moves on to the next, uh, uh, toward home or a place of safety. And so um, the structure is Gulliver's Travels, but also these other things, and it's you know, uh, pretty ancient. And um, I, I grew up wanting to write because I was reading horror and science fiction and comic books. And so using fantastic elements is sort of built into my idea of storytelling. Sometimes you use realism, sometimes fantasy. You pick the, the right tool for the job. Um, and obviously, uh, something like The Odyssey and uh, Gulliver's Travels, these, you know, these fantastic books, um, uh, were, were important to me in terms of seeing that sort of link between uh, the so-called classics and, and, and genre fiction, fantastic fiction. When, when I was thinking of, um, of Gulliver's Travels as well, the, the thought of, because obviously that's held up as, a, as one of the greatest works of satire. And then I asked myself the question, like, is, could the Underground Railroad be considered a, a work of satire? And in a way, because then I had to ask myself the question, is, can you have satire which is not funny? Uh, because obviously, you know, one of the mechanisms of satire is to... to hold up a mirror to society and to sort of reflect its own um, sort of ridiculousness back at itself or its own, its own structural absurdities. And that's certainly what the Underground Railroad does, but it's not, it's not a funny book. I mean, it's, it's actually, it's quite a, it's quite a, quite a harrowing Not funny read. book. Um, and and I, I was just curious, I mean, did, could, could you think, do you think of it as a kind of a, a work of satire or is there another way? Yeah, I, I mean, it? usually, I, I make jokes in the book or, or use satire as much more broad and mm -hmm. definitely I felt that um, uh, the way I want to talk about slavery couldn't accommodate my usual sort of brand of satire. Um, definitely this book has the least amount of jokes per page of anything I, I've written. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think going, going back to Swift, I, I was, I kept saying like Gulliver's Travels, so 
before I started writing this book, I thought, oh, I'll actually reread mm -hmm. Glover's Travels. I maybe read, uh, read bits of it in elementary school. And um, it is a satire, but it's a satire of things I have no idea like, what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is like 19th, 18th century uh, uh, British politics and religion. And I'm, you know, not very religious. I worship Satan and have no really grounding in all these sort of discussions about um, this or that. Uh, faction. Um, so I, I think the narrator in this book does have a, a sardonic quality sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I allow the narrator, him, she, it, to, uh, you know, sometimes uh, editorialize on, on what's going on. And, and sometimes the ironies um, uh, can produce a kind of grim mm -hmm. humor. But um, I guess I sort of sh shy away from satire in the way I usually practice it. With, as we spoke about earlier, so each of the, uh, each of the states that when she resurfaces, when Cora resurfaces um, from the Underground Railroad represents what you described as a, a sort of a, an, an American possibility. Am I quoting you back right there? Yeah. Sure. Um, and so we're not going we to, we have time to sort of to unpick exactly what's going on in each state and also we don't want to spoil the book for, <laughs> for the readers. But I'm just, I'm curious about the, the conceptualization of each one. So you mentioned the one, and I'll, let me refer to my notes, where so she's in the attic, that is North Carolina. I call that the white supremacist state in uh -huh. my notes, and then I'm kind of stuck. Uh -huh. um, there's uh, Indiana, which is a black utopia. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what's the best case scenario for a free black person in 1850? And it's Valentine Farm, the, the place in the book that Cora comes to, a self-sufficient community, uh, black run, uh, with their own sort of uh, codes. And then there's a um, paternalistic mm -hmm. white-run society in South Carolina mm -hmm. where they give, um, uh, they buy slaves from their masters, set them free, and then give them housing, education, uh, and jobs in a sort of play on the um, great society uh, programs in America in the 1960s. Um, and then, of course, things go wrong, or else the, the book mm -hmm. would be very short. Um, and, uh, and each one of them is sort of like an arena for CORE to test a different idea of freedom. Uh, South Carolina has its virtues, seemingly. Uh, Indiana, uh, what does it mean to be away from the plantation, but trapped in North Carolina, this white supremacist mm -hmm. state? And, and these were obviously all, all uh, situations to an extent that you, you, you engineered, you, you conceptualized. Um, but you, you gave them precise names, and South Carolina, North Carolina, Indiana. And somebody who doesn't come from the United States and therefore doesn't necessarily have uh, the sort of the backstory, the sort of the resonances of each of these names. I'm just curious about how potentially the book was received by the specific states that you... Sure, that you I mean, um, uh, before this book, you know, I probably read like three times in the South. Not invited, strangely. <laughs> and then, but uh, I was surprised that it was embraced um, by some parts of the South, definitely uh, the coastal states, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina. Um, I went to um, Tennessee for the first time, uh, so not all parts of the South. Uh, but, you know, strangely, and I was delighted that they were sort of reckoning with their history and some of the ideas that the book raises, mm -hmm. and that was definitely new for me, and uh, I was glad to, to travel in the South. Um, uh, but your specific decision to, to was totally to random. These okay. I mean, um, uh, I had these ideas for these different states, but the, the place names were, I didn't decide until I actually started writing, and I knew I wanted her to go up the coast, and then jag into the Midwest, and up. Um, and so it could have it starts in Georgia now, but it could have started in Florida. The crop could have been sugar instead of cotton. And uh, South Carolina, in my book, could have been Georgia. Um, I really I just opened, I think, Wikipedia that day and tried to figure out different routes mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and decided to start in Georgia and not Florida. And obviously one of the, the freedoms having uh, this structure gives you is to uh, to be able to play with the idea of of history or, and of of time and of, of progress, and it's very difficult uh, to read the Underground Railroad and not to to 
not to see contemporary resonances, not to see, you know, we, we can't read it and imagine it's all set in the, in the mid 19th century. There's, there's so much that throws us uh, to, to what's been going on in the last few years, what was going, you know, the, uh, during the civil rights movements and things like that. And so it, it allows you to sort of, um, I guess in a way to, to, to show the kind of, I don't know if it's, it would be called this sort of circularity of time, but to show that, that there's, a, there's, there's a certain rhythm and a certain pattern. Well, which, continue. Which um, keeps I continue. I mean, I think uh, um, I didn't have this sort of forced uh, comparisons between 1850 and, and the present day. I was researching uh, the slave patrollers, and slave patrollers were the police force in the South before there was a police force. And they could stop any black person, free or slave, and demand to see their papers. Um, and it was startling to me to read memoirs of slaves, uh, former slaves, and, and how they would describe being stopped by a slave patroller in 1850. There's so much of the same language, uh, humiliation and rage that I've used to describe when I've been stopped by police uh, for being black in the wrong place, interrogated, handcuffed. Um, and so I didn't have to draw the, you know, hit people over the head with a comparison between the slave patrollers and, and some white law enforcement now, it's there. It, it's, it's there you know, every uh, six months when there's a high profile case of a, a, a black person unarmed being you know, shot in the back. Um, I think, I, I mean, I knew that when I was writing it. Uh, I, it was surprising the book came out and then three months later we elected Donald Trump because definitely the, the Severe white supremacy, uh, as depicted and portrayed in the book, seem remote. Mm -hmm. And then we elect a, a white supremacist president. Mm -hmm. And um, I think a lot of people are surprised. I think we're still surprised. Uh, but I think that uh, even makes the point even more fully how far uh, we have not come. Mm -hmm. I, th I mean, that's quite a curious thing that uh, I think because of the... Uh, the, the turbulence of the last few years, it's quite easy to sort of, to confuse the, the timeline of the book being conceived and written and published and to think that it might be in some way a, a, a response to uh, America of the, last, of, of, the, of the last couple of years. But in fact, you, the, the book was published in, in 2016. 2016, yeah. And, and so you, you would have been writing it for several years before that. You said that it was an idea that had been sort of playing on your mind for quite a few years before that. It, but I find, that, I find it quite curious that the, the moment that it seemed right for you to write that book was in the sort of the, the middle of this, the second term of Barack Obama, when sort of, uh, I guess, kind of on paper, uh, America was considered the least racist it had ever been. And I'm just wondering about the 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 situation and the context that made you write this particular book at that particular time? No, I mean, uh, when I decided in, in 2014 to pull the trigger, I had the idea, like, 14 years. Um, it really felt, you know, divorced from what was going on in, in American society at that time. Maybe Barack Obama's uh, administration gave me, like, the psychological safe space to go, but I mean, I definitely was not thinking about that at the time. I, I mean, I had the idea in the year 2000, I was 30. Um, I was not the most mature person, and it seemed like such a good idea that I knew I would have screwed it up mm -hmm. if I had tried it back then. I thought if I wrote more books, I might become a better writer and be able to engage with the material. I thought if I was older, uh, I might bring whatever maturity, maturity I gained in those years to the book, if I, you know, traveled more, had some kind of Hemingway-esque adventures, stabbed a hobo with a penknife or something, <laughs> um, I could bring that, you know, to the book. Um, and so each time I finished a project, I, I would ask myself, uh, am I ready? And, and the answer is always no. And still about, you know, four years ago, um, I had sold the book to my editor. I was having some doubts, uh, so I decided to tell my wife about this Underground Railroad idea I'd had in the back of my head for so long. As some of you know, sometimes in a marriage you have to make conversation and kill the silences. So I, I told her about it, and she just said, well, the book you're working on now about a Brooklyn writer going through a midlife crisis sounds a bit questionable, but this other idea sounds 
good, and uh, as opposed to the other one, and that sort of started me. Um, <laughs> I want to come back just before we finish to talking about the, 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 I guess, the context of the publication and the context of the the book's success. But I, I, I don't think we can we can have a conversation about the the Underground Railroad without also talking about Ridgeway. I mean, we we touched on him very briefly, but so Ridgeway is the. Uh, the human villain of the book, I guess. I mean, he's the sort of the embodiment of um, of the, the of, 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 of this kind of idea of white supremacy, and also of the sort of the, I guess, the the contradictions of the the, the, the slave state. Um, now, you mentioned uh, a moment ago um, you know, the, the, these comparisons between. Slaves being stopped in 1850 by the slave catchers and the um, and uh, black, black people black being team, stopped yeah. in, in the U.S. today and Ridgeway, I don't know. In, in some ways, he does seem like a very modern villain in a sense. And I'm just wondering, like, how much of that was drawn from uh, from sort of contemporary experience and these kind of stories about about the way. Yeah, the police no, I mean, like, I think um, I, I, I mentioned like trying to figure out Cora having an idea of who she was and then trying to figure out once who she is once she has to appear on the page. And um, definitely Ridgeway, I sort of, I knew I wanted him to embody a certain philosophy about white supremacy and manifest destiny and imperialism. And then I got to page 72 when he was supposed to appear, but I didn't know how he was gonna walk and talk. And um, you know, the terrible thing about writing novels is that they take a long time and they destroy your happiness. But the good thing is that if you get stuck, you can just keep going. And so for a few months, I just had in my manuscript, insert Ridgeway introduction here and, and, and kept going. Um, and I think he, I finally figured out who he was when I um, read a book called Gateway to Freedom, written by Eric Foner, a big historian in the United States. And he writes about... Um, uh, it's about the Underground Railroad, but sort of centered around New York and the, and the, the war between abolitionist lawyers and, and slave catchers and the sort of legal uh, back and forth they would use to either um, you know, free, the, free the captured slaves from the jail or, or, or take them down before a lawyer could in intervene. And it seemed, um, oh, Ridgeway comes to New York mm -hmm. and uh, he reinvents himself uh, in this city, he comes, he comes from the south, but he comes to New York and reinvents himself the way so many people do, and that became a hook mm -hmm. uh, where he finally clicked. I had a way into his, his, his character. Um, and so, and again with Ridgeway, I was not thinking about sort of contemporary uh, America, but the sort of, I guess they call them sort of charismatic psychopaths, uh, whether it's sort of Ahab or mm. Hannibal Lecter, um, the sort of, you know, strangely American uh, psychotics who make compelling villains, and and he repeatedly refers to something which he think which he calls the the American imperative, um, and it, it it's it, it's it was a phrase which has a sort of curious resonance because obviously we're we're familiar with like for example the term the American dream, um, which if if I'm right I don't think the term American dream would have existed back at that time but he but he has this very particular uh, concept of the American imperative which is a sort of um, which seems to to encompass a lot of what might be the sort of the negative consequences of of the way certain people understand the American dream. This kind of you know you go out there and you get it, and you uh, if you can't uh, if you if, if you can't subjugate somebody, then you exterminate um, the person. And I was just wondering that sort of that concept of the American imperative. Uh, well, well, I think you know um, people say American uh, slavery is Americans' original sin. You know, the original sin is the dispossession of, of native peoples. Uh, uh, I think all these, things, all these things are sort of tied together, and then the American imperative brings in capitalism, imperialism, uh, and the, the making of people into property. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you can't really sort of take, extract the history of America and take out slavery without taking out capitalism as well. I mean, all, all, all these sort of forces come together. And so just to, um, just to conclude, um, obviously, I, you know, when I was reading the introduction, I mentioned that you, you won the Perlitzer, you won the National Book Award. I mean, the, you mentioned that the Underground Railroad has been translated into about 40 
different languages, which is sort of it's, reached, it's reaching an audience which the vast majority of books don't reach. Um, and it's sort of it's having an impact in a way that uh, the vast majority of books don't. And I'm just curious of your experience as a writer. Did, did you have a sense when you were writing it that this was a book that was going to to take you to an audience that you you hadn't reached before, that it was going to have a sort of a social importance uh, beyond what, what perhaps previous works had done? Uh, no, I was quite surprised, but it's quite a pleasant uh, surprise. <laughs> I mean, I think um, it has traveled, you know, uh, much further, different countries than my previous books. Um, you know, I think, sadly, the dynamic between master and slave is a dynamic of much of human history, whether it's royalty and serfs. Um, the subjugation of the oppressed by the oppressors is something that, unfortunately, uh, doesn't just belong to America. And then I was surprised by, by say, readers in France or, or Poland linking the French resistance, the Polish resistance, the abolitionists, um, subverting uh, uh, the malevolent power, um, sneaking around, being guerrillas in, in a certain sort of way. And so I, I was not thinking of that when I was writing it. I was just trying to not mess up my idea. And I think I, I, guess I, I sort of realized that the book was different when I got a third of the way through and then I showed it to my, my wife, uh, my editor, and my agent. And those are three different people, not the same person. And, um, <laughs> and they just seemed really, really enthusiastic. They're like, it's good. I mean, we watch other books too, I guess, but this one uh, seems a bit gooder. Um, and so just, that just meant the next 200 pages, I was like, don't fuck it up, Colson. Oh, the first 200 <laughs> pages are good, don't, just don't fuck it up. Um, and then I knew other people liked it. I knew I liked it when I got to the last 30 pages and everything came together. And I, felt, I, feel, I still feel like that's like the, sort of the best writing I've done the last, the end of that book. Um, and I look back fondly upon the days of composition uh, and, the, uh, and the months afterwards when I would go back to the ending of the book and, and just feel like I did what I, what I wanted to set out to do. And so just finally, to finish that, because this is the, in preparation for tonight's event, this was the, the third time that I'd, I'd read the novel. I read it on publication. I read it when you visited Paris um, last year, and I, I read it again uh, about a week ago. And when I first read it, that was sort of, yeah, it was in the, the closing days of Obama's presidency, but before Trump was elected. Uh, when I read it last summer, obviously, you know, Trump had been inaugurated, but it was before things, events like, for example, in Charlottesville. Um, and then, re and so read it the third time. The book has changed for me each time. It's sort of it's opened out. It's it's it's, it's provided something different. It's provided um, different insights and different angles. And I'm just wondering to finish if you do, do you look at it differently based on some of the things which have gone on, particularly in the United States over the last couple of years. Well, I think you know. Um you know, there are a few sections I read, and, some, and like I have a 10 minute section and a five minute section, and I sort of practiced them and got them down. And then once Trump, Trump got elected, I started reading uh, a, a speech from Valentine Farm. There's a, a sort of progressive voice named Lander, and he gives this idea of what's next for Valentine Farm, uh, black people in 1850, and I think by extension, uh, America now. And, and that seemed to resonate more than some of the other things I, I'd read uh, from the book. Um, it's despairing, it's hopeful, it's ambivalent. It um, sort of looks to a better time than uh, the characters are existing in, in, in the book. And, and that section started speaking to me more and became you know, part of my uh, sort of repertoire. Um, how do I wrestle with you know, where the country's at right now? Mm. Well, that is, unfortunately, all we've got time for. Um, I think after that uh, last 45 minutes, uh, those of you who haven't read the book uh, should probably be in no doubt that it's going to be one of your, certainly one of your next reads. It's really an extraordinary work. As I said, I've read it three times. I'm pretty sure I'm going to read it several more times. It's a book that keeps, uh, keep, keeps giving, keeps getting richer um, with every read. A truly extraordinary uh, book, worthy in my opinion, of all, all of the prizes and all of the prizes received. And um, so all that remains for me to say is please join me in thanking Colson Whitehead one more time. Thank you, Adam Biles and Colson Whitehead. I'm talking about sharing your ideas. 
on this uh, on this amazing book and the wider context of the book, which is the world, as you've heard. Um, you can hear him talk in Paris this weekend, but for those who won't be able to make it to Paris, it's worthwhile going there for the festival. But if you can't make it to Paris, uh, there's a new book coming out in the summer next year. So we're looking forward to that as well. Um, I'd like to welcome Annelise Beck and Richard Powers on stage to talk about the overstory, and it will be about the world as well. How could it else be? Um, and as an anecdote here as well, I can tell you that there is an uh, opera being prepared that will be um, premiere in the Opera House of Brussels La Monnaie in September 2020. So that's something to look forward to. But first we have this conversation. Please join me in welcoming Annelies Beck and Richard Powers. Thank you so much. Welcome back, Richard Powers. Welcome terug in België. Thank you well. You speak a little bit of Dutch, don't you? Nog steeds, een klein beetje. Het wordt uh, iets minder uh, met elk jaar. <laughs> <laughs> Should come back more often. Oh, yeah. You're always welcome. I don't think Mr. Powers needs much of an introduction. Um, let me mention a couple of titles of your numerous novels. The Time of Our Singing, Generosity, The Echo Maker, Orfeo. All novels in which you lead the reader into a world that you spell out in the most poetic way, um, creating characters that stay with you long, long, long after you finish reading the book. And especially the novel we're going to talk about tonight um, is one you live in, um, whether you want to or not. I assure you, 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 you will want to. The overstory is nice. what we're going to talk about. Before we delve into the book, I would like to um, quote one of your characters back to you, Patricia. She's a um, scientist. She knows about the life of trees. And um, at one point, she mentions, she's written her second book. And she says, or she thinks, it is weighing on her conscience for its cost in pine. Mm. Now, is this one weighing on your conscience, <laughs> knowing that it's about trees yeah. and us, but mostly trees? I'm afraid I've reached the age in life where everything weighs on my conscience. <laughs> yeah. I, I, bef before we start, it's, it, it's, it, it's a great thrill to, to meet Colson Whitehead. He, he has been an inspiration to me since his first book. I'm just sitting here saying, never follow a guy who's that smart and that witty. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm going to be second-guessing everything, every answer that I give tonight. But, um, well, sure. I, I, I'll quote another judgment on the moral choice of making and doing things and using trees. Um, which is, uh, I, I think, also, uh, uh, well, uh, well, actually, it comes from another character uh, who spends the better part of a year and a half at the top of a redwood tree um, trying to save it unsuccessfully. Um, what you make from the tree should be at least as good as what the tree was. The problem is, the more you learn about trees, the harder it is to live up to that requirement because they are true miracles. But the, the, I, I think the choice of what to do with them is also a choice of what to do with ourselves. You know, it's a, the, the, the program of human mastery and control that I think connects this book with the Underground Railroad is also a self-diminishment. I mean, the, the more we sink into this state that psychologists call species loneliness, the more we convince ourselves that we're the only interesting game in town and everything else is just resource for us, the less capable we are of connecting with those things that could, in fact, give an external meaning to who we are and what we're doing and what we're trying to make. Mm -hmm. 
All of which is to say, no, I can't defend uh, the use of the number of pines that went into the making of the book. But I would hope that the reader who gets to the end of the book is conscious of those calculations in a, in a new way. I'm happy to say that we did put an environmental uh, statement in, in the book, uh, in, in the uh, English language edition of the book, saying that 100% of the paper was post-consumer recycle saving a great number of trees and a great deal of water. But we live, you know, we use, we do, we make, and we use up. There is another moment where one of the characters says, we're not saying don't use the trees. We're simply saying, don't treat them as a given, treat them as a gift. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to squander a gift. The book is structured like a tree. It starts with um, the section roots, then builds up along the trunk. Stories intertwine. The roots are nine separate stories, novels in themselves, if you like, centered around nine different characters, all linked to one specific tree. And it's almost like a snapshot each time of American history, in a way. Then getting together, growing stronger um, along the trunk, crowning out, and then giving off seeds in the last section. I was wondering, did you have a huge tree painted on your wall? Did you have this structure drawn out as a work of art on your wall, or was it all in your head? You know, never, never trust a novelist's answer to a question like that because they're going to lie to you. Um, <laughs> Give us a beautiful lie, Mr. <laughs> okay, Powers. Okay, there we go. That's, Any that's lie the will challenge. do, as long as it's right. beautifully told. Yeah. No, I had no idea what I was doing at the beginning. And that's a great lie. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, just, just as Colson was saying, insert Ridgeway here, you know, there was a fair amount of sleight of hand that I had to use on myself to keep me in harness and keep me going towards something that I couldn't envision. And I had certain vague thematic senses, a kind of uh, a nebulous sense of a navigation of a lighthouse at the end that I was heading toward. And the first draft was a total mess. I mean, I... Um, I had a vast number of characters, and most of them remained in the final draft. Nine characters in a novel who are all central protagonists. It's a hard, it's a hard thing on the writer to try to keep track of and juggle. It's an especially hard thing on the reader. And I had initially thought that I could tell this story chronologically because that might give the reader the easiest course of entry into what ends up being a long-duration story and a complicated story. When I read it, the second draft, I said, well, I, I can't keep these people straight. You know, I don't know, you know where the dramatic tension is. And it was only in, in the course of several revisions that I came up with this idea of, of um, producing the backstories as if you said, you know, as if they are standalone short stories. And then there was this, uh, you know, this little light bulb that said, ah, you have a structural, a potential for leveraging a structure um, and the lie would be, oh yes, my unconscious must have known that it was there all the time and I just had to discover it. I just got lucky. You got lucky. Yeah. But it also ties in with, with the, uh, one of the many motives in, in the book. Time, I'm quoting right. now, was right. not a line unrolling in front of her. It was a column of concentric circles with herself at the core and the present floating outward along the most along the outermost rim, future selves stacked up above and behind her, and so on and so on. So basically time, the way time is incorporated in trees. Yeah, yeah. So, so there are multiple challenges um, that I set myself with regard to the treatment of time. Uh, w one is simply the, the, the Part of the reason that has so removed us from being able to see the neighbors and to understand them as essential components of our own history and our own essence is simply that they're, they're unfolding on a time frame, a time scale that it, it, you know, we can't wrap our heads around. I mean, there is a bristlecone pine, an individual tree in the, uh, uh, the White Mountains of California that's several centuries older 
than the earliest pyramids in Egypt. I mean, that, that tree, the individual tree, has been alive that long. And actually, that's dwarfed by the time frame of, a, of the, this clonal colony in Aspen that Patricia Westerford goes to visit, where the individual trees above ground are 75 years old or 100 years old, but they're being generated out of this clonal mass of subterranean root that's on the order of 100,000 years to a million years. And that, that, the genetics of that individual tree have been going on for that length of time. When I first wrote the book, I thought, uh, why don't I try to treat this to, 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 to produce a narrative that will completely change the way that people think about the unfolding of time by making trees the central protagonist of the book. Uh, unfortunately, like Colson, I didn't, didn't have a, 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 a person who could say, uh, in bad, bad idea, you might try to rethink this. But um, there were certain technical challenges with making trees the central characters and, and, and yet sympathetic to the average reader. But what I do is invent human narratives that juxtapose this mismatch of, of temporal scale. Uh, so for instance, um, the, the, the book opens with the account of a Norwegian immigrant who arrives uh, around the, the time of the Fugitive Slave Act, actually, who arrives in Brooklyn, uh, marries, brings his wife out to the Midwest, accidentally carries along with him a few chestnuts in his pocket from the Northeast, plants them, and one of them actually survives in Iowa. By the time this family has gone on for three or four generations, that chestnut is a pretty significant tree. He, one of his descendants, his, his uh, uh, grandson, becomes obsessed with photography and falls in love with these first commercial available cameras, you know, the brownie cameras that became the mass market entry into photography. There's very little to photograph in Iowa after the first you know, couple of weeks of having such a hobby. Um, and, and he ends up taking a picture of this chestnut tree once a month on the same day of the month for the rest of his life. His son gets roped into the project just because there are so many years, and you know, it becomes this kind of throwing uh, bad, uh, a good time after bad time. By the end, they end up with this collection of photographs from the same point of the same tree. It, it becomes the first strangest, longest silent film ever shot in the Midwest because it's this flip book that shows this enormous tree spiraling upwards and spreading out on a frame where the generations of this family are just coming and going. It's like stop action, uh, fast motion, uh, uh, speed it up film. So devices like that or narrative interactions between the time frame of people and the time frame of trees was the way that I tried to, to create some of this uh, uh, cyclical, right, uh, out, outward uh, expanse that, that uh, sets the human narrative. It, it, it gives it a different uh, um, dramatic impetus. It's, it's basically saying um, the stories that we tell about ourselves have always kept off stage huge processes that are invisible to us. What brought us on? Why did you feel the need to write this and about trees particularly? Was there an epiphany or had this been growing in the back of your mind, like Olson says, something you'd been carrying for years and years and years before yeah. you felt ready to tackle it? I, I, think, I, I think there is a continuity between this book and, and the rest of my uh, corpus. You know, there's, a, there's a thematic uh, obsession uh, that I've had since the beginning with this idea that we're only telling part of the story about ourselves if we limit ourselves to the psychological and the sociological. Uh, that, that there's this immense contribution of the non-human to the human story. When I have treated this in the past, it would be, I mean, it, it had concentrated on certain things like the prosthetic devices that people have made for centuries that change invisibly to us 
what we call human nature, that our machines and our, and our, and our computers and so forth, those non-human components are in a dialogue with us and constantly altering uh, what we are able to do and what, we, and what we think our purpose here is or our possibilities here are. Um, and I certainly have treated ecological themes in the past too. Uh, one of my books treats the similarity, uh, the, 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 the kinship between uh, humans and birds, which initially seems like a very the echo, maker. The echo maker, yeah, which initially seems like a very large stretch, um, but uh, uh, the the the, uh, the family uh, resemblance becomes stronger and stronger as the narrative goes on. What's different? The urgency here, however, yeah. seems stronger, as if, as if, yeah, an urgency. Is that the right word to Absolutely. use? Absolutely. I mean, I, I I think what's happening here. Um, I mean, while I have ventured into this story about the reciprocal and interdependent relationship between the us and the not us, I never went right to the source. I mean, until I was 55, I, I couldn't tell a, a, an ash from an elm. I mean, I, you know, they, they, were, they were pretty, they were aesthetic, they were delightful, and on occasion they smelled good, and, you know. Um, but they weren't part of my life. And in, in the, you know, for, for me to cross that final threshold and say, we have built civilization on the back of something that we have rendered entirely invisible, right, is, is you know, the, the, is to lie about who we are. And built literally because the railroad tracks, the, the oh. houses, everything from the very beginning of the origin of the U.S., yeah. so to speak, not let yeah. alone Europe and other parts in the world. And, and, and you know, not, not just the resource of wood as a building tool, but the, they make our atmosphere. They filter our water. Right? They, as, as the Buddha is credited with saying, they give food and shelter and shade and sustenance and materials even to the man with the axe who's going to cut it down, right? It, you know, Colson was talking about, you know, uh, uh, you, using Swift to justify what, what seemed like a bizarre uh, uh, plot synopsis, you know, um, to, to, to friends and, and family along the way. You haven't seen Puzzlement until you, you spend several years telling your friends and family, I'm going to write a novel about trees. <laughs> right? um, but in fact, it's a novel about human potential and human uh, destiny and the, the, the narrative uh, of control and mastery, the sense of exceptionalism um, that has put us in a place where we can't sustain. I mean, it's a, it's a story about what we've done to home. Mm -hmm. And also a story of awakening and people um, waking up to this realization we are part of something bigger and we better take care of the world around us that sustains us, that makes us possible, right. even though we prefer not to know it or ignore it. Um, and they get up and fight it. Yeah. What I find interesting is that you also insert a character, Adam, who's a psychologist in training, who is studying the idealists fighting right. the Wooding, wood cutting companies, etc. I wondered, is this a kind of second guessing the strength of our own morals or of our fighting back against what humanity did wrong in the past? Not trusting idealism entirely? It's more than that, I think. I mean, what, what Adam studies is cognitive bias and cognitive blindness. Um, our belief that somehow our rational minds and our intellects are sufficient for guiding 
the world that we want to build. And the belief somehow that we can go it alone and the belief that everything else is there for our dominion and, and mere resource for this project. And it, it's precisely that estrangement that's pulling the world down around our ears. I mean, uh, the people that you mention in the book become absolutely incensed, as I did when I, when I did the research for the book, that of all of the, 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 the four massive forests that filled North America at the time that the crazies came, 98% um, is gone, right? And that's enough to turn a non-political person into, into a political person. And, and remember, I mean, the, 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 the history of civilization has in some ways be, been the history of the expanding capacity for humans to empathize with entities that were not always granted personhood, mm -hmm. right? Um, and uh, the, the first half of this evening was very much about that theme, but the fact that children didn't have personhood, uh, women didn't have personhood, other races didn't have personhood in this, in this bizarre and perverted scheme of, of white centrism. And people with uh, uh, mental disabilities didn't have personhood, and we've been extending that, uh, that tent uh, fitfully with many reverses along the way, and yet it's a great challenge to say, think about living here on this earth as if you were not part of this complicated reciprocal process called life, but somehow in the driver's seat and able to turn everything else into a subservient uh, entity. This is why I think, you know, uh, I also have found that the, the arrival of Donald Trump has changed retroactively what, how this book is contextualized in, 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 at this moment. How so? Well, in the same way that the, the not especially subtle uh, uh, dog whistles of Trump for uh, males over females, whites over blacks, uh, Americans over other, na all other nationalities. The last part of that formula is, and humans above all other living things. I mean, here we have a, a president who's reversed in 20 months, 60 years of incredibly hard fought environmental legislation. Legislation that was the first little dawning indication of consciousness that somehow we needed to live here, that we needed to accommodate the neighbors, that they had to be an active part of our imagination in the sense of, uh, of our purpose, mm -hmm. right? So there is a continuity in, in um, the, the, the challenge that the present presents to a book that wants to challenge the notion of who's in charge and, and who's subordinate. Do you feel you've been more politicized or politicized through the process of writing this book? Sure, yeah. And I think, I think it would be hard to spend six years reading about what we've done to the planet and not be desperate. Right? Desperate even. Yeah. And I, I think in desperation, in the, in the knowledge that we cannot live like this, comes political engagement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is a scary thing. I mean, just as people raise their eyebrows at the idea that a literary novel might take non-humans as a serious subject, so there is something slightly taboo about a literary novel that decides to be polemical about, about uh, certain issues. I mean, the, the, the great formula is this sort of um, moral ambiguity. Like all the, all the good people have to sh be shown to have flaws and, and, and moral failings. And, and all the villains have to be humanized at some point and, and shown to be um, actually good at heart. Well, if you really are going at it, if you're really gonna bring home the cha this, this challenge to um, 
a kind of anthrocentrism, a kind of individual commodity culture or a supremacist culture, maybe it's okay to say no. It's not that ambiguous. I mean, let's think clearly about it. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm torn. Um, I, I know that uh, we, we develop skills as readers and we look for those things. We look we, we, we want to end up at the end of the book saying, ah, it's so rich, and I, everybody, I was sympathetic toward everybody, and yet I also felt some reservation about everybody. And, and to me, in a sense, that there's a danger of slipping back. Moral relativism, in a sense, is returning to that sense that meaning is an entirely personal thing, an entirely subjective thing, and we can each, as individuals, we can each come to our own. I wanted to try at least once saying, no, we can't, actually. There, there, there is morality outside of us. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's the reception been like so far? Like Colson, and I have been very pleasantly surprised. Um, it's, my f it's the first book I've ever written that, that went to the bestseller list and stayed there for a while. So the readership is out there. They're there, ready yeah, to and read. Yeah, and you know, it's okay. Maybe, maybe you can have both an enthusiastic readership and an angry readership, you know? It's, it's not, you, you don't have to feel, liking and not liking, really, you know, Borges has this great line, he says, liking and, li and not liking are sentimental actions, and they have nothing to do with literary criticism, right? The problem is, w once you so deeply assimilate the individual commodity culture, and my God, we've given it enough tools now to make it absolutely over impossible to escape the mental colonization of, is this a four-star book or a five-star book or a 3.7-star book, right? Once, once you turn it entirely into the book should come to me and give me a five-star experience, experience, something's wrong. I mean, we, we have to, as, as writers, we have to reserve the right to say, hey, let's try something else, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. I want to... Um Bring in Ovid, Metamorphosis. Patricia, um, as a child, is given this book by her father, who means a lot to her, who teaches her to see and to listen and to be attentive to nature. Um, there is a lot of transformation going on in the book. Characters change all the time. Um, stories change, of course, layer over layer. There are uh, references to people looking like trees at some stage. Um, what made you bring in of it here? You know, it's, 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 I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, earlier I said that it's, it's, all, it's, it's a very nervous activity to introduce the non-human into literary fiction. But in fact, that's so recent that prohibition is so recent, or that neglect, let's say, that blindness is so recent. I mean, throughout almost all of world literature, throughout the most of the history of world literature, the non-humans have been at the center of our stories, right? And off, it's a in great example, and, yeah. right? I mean, what he's, what he's doing in a, in a very interesting way is codifying and, and collecting and anthologizing stories that are warnings from the past that say, don't ever forget that the proximity between you and other things, even ones that don't look like you or that don't unfold under, this, uh, under the same time frame, is much stronger than you think, right? We, we at, at, even in the classical era, we knew we were heading on an adventure that had something to do with making ourselves the heroes of the world. And I think the Ovid stories and the indigenous myths and, and all of that great tradition of literature that says, wait a minute, mm -hmm. there are other players here that are allowing you to do things or to preventing you from doing things. That's the tradition that I want to tap back into. And also take forward and show a new version of that kind of sure. mythology, like in the game world, Nile is, is one of the right. main characters, one right. of the nine. Yep. Um, and it, it grows over his head, yeah. literally. Gets away from him. Yeah. yeah. But is, is this you saying also, watch out? Uh, you mentioned that before in other novels you, you talked or explored this idea of computation and where does it take us. Is, is it a threat or may it 
might it lead us back to becoming part of the whole? Because yeah. that's what you compare the way computer systems work to the intricacies of trees as well at some point. Yes, that's terrific. That's, uh, so just to give a little context for what Annalise just asked, one of these nine frames is about a South Asian, a second, first generation American child of a South Asian immigrant who ends up in Silicon Valley at the beginning of the computer age and falls in love with the virtual, the possibilities of the virtual worlds and becomes a great pioneer for the creation of inner worlds, places where we can live instead of living out here. Interestingly, it's one of the more controversial frames of, of re the reading of the book so far because the great, the committed environmentalist will say, I remember the, the, the battles that you're describing. I loved this woman who understands that trees are communicating with each other, that they're feeding and nurturing each other. But what is this computer thing doing in the background? Why did you even bring that story in? It seems like a separate entity altogether. My answer to that is multifold, actually. I mean, one, agrarian nostalgia or some kind of back to the land or pre-technological and utopian environmentalism is not gonna cut it. We're not going back, right? We're, we're not going back. Um, it, if we are to figure out how to live here, it's going to be with all our tools intact. And I would, I would even argue further, I would say, in, isn't it interesting that the environmental movement and the ec and ecological consciousness and the understanding of complex reciprocal relations in the living world arises at the same historical moment as the advent of massive computing. It is actually only with these prosthetics that our very limited brains have been able to ma ma wrap themselves around the complex issues of understanding just how intricate a forest is. And if I say, okay, step one of this revolution has, has depended upon making ourselves different through another kind of non-human intermediary, the next steps are also going to. So in a sense, the, his vision at the end of the book is that our descendants, the post-biological artifacts that people make, artificial intelligence, might somehow act as interpreters for us with these vast living processes that we haven't been able to read or understand or be conversant in. I, you know, whether or not that vision will be borne out or whether it's you know, palatable or, or effective, that remains to be seen. But I simply wanted to say this ecological question is, is not going to be solved by a trivialization. It's not gonna be solved by keeping capitalism intact and just tr making wilderness a sort of precious little artifact that we can you know, put in our collectible list. Right? It's going to be accomplished, if at all, by a total transformation of human consciousness. Transformation, revolutionize human um, consciousness in a way. Maybe this is a good point to tell us a bit more about this world of trees and how they communicate and the, the, the complexities of what we simply see as a forest, but that is such a layered and, yeah. and multifaceted yeah. world. A lot of you will know this because the developments of what's called in North America the new forestry, they've been underway for some decades now, but they're now really starting to explode into public consciousness. The upshot, I mean, there are, there are many, many avenues of, of research, but the upshot is a far deeper understanding of the interdependence of living things in the forest, and in particular, not just, not just trees of the same species, but trees of different species. So the, the, if you want to summarize the, the, the new forestry, it comes down to this. There are no individuals in a living system, right? That there are only networks of completely interdependent life. Now we know trees signal each other over the air. When one tree is attacked by an insect invasion, they send out chemical semaphores that alert other trees 
uh, in, in the area uh, to start producing their own defenses, their own chemical defenses. In a, in a way, they're sharing an immune system. Right? And some of you will have seen last week, I think it was, this amazing um, uh, film that's been circulating on the internet that puts a, a, a visible marker on these chemical signals. So you see a tree signaling to itself the other parts of itself using, interestingly, chemicals that are similar to neuroprocessor chemicals so that when one part of the tree is attacked, the other part of the tree learns about it and starts to set up its preventions. Even more amazing than this will be the, you know, the, the, this unfolding discovery that's just in its infancy now about the ways in which trees are connected underground by fungal filaments. The tree, the, 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 uh, these fungal threads uh, get from the tree the sugars, the hydrocarbons that it cannot produce for itself because it doesn't have photosynthesis. So it's getting food from the trees. It's giving the trees secondary metabolites that the tree can't extract easily from the soil. And then it starts functioning like this kind of socialist banking system underground where the big trees with great energy surpluses are keeping alive these little scraggly trees for 60, 70, 80 years in the understory just on the welfare state. Right? I was going to ask whether you had been called a socialist since I, this book. I think this book will certainly seal that label if, it, if the yeah. clues weren't obvious <laughs> earlier on. Well, but, but here's the thing. We have been drawing for a couple centuries now erroneous conclusions about what evolution says about the possibilities for ethical behavior. Right? We have this idea of survival of the strongest, which is completely mistaken. Right? What the new forestry is, and what Patricia Westerford contributes as, as her... Drawn on a right, real-life Drawn person, on no? real-life research, is that for every act of competition, there are many, many acts of, of cooperation. And remember that survival of the fittest, fittest means not most powerful, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that this model of, of, of Trumpian supremacy, right? Fittest, uh, Trump would make a great Spencerian social Darwinist, right? Um, fittest means the best suited to the environment, where the environment is 99.9% .9 living things. So the, the, the individual species that survives is going to be the one that is most suited to get along with and in between, in the interstices between everything else that's alive, right? The only, I mean, everything that survives for any length of time does so by virtue of all the other living things in their ecosystem. That should say something to the human species. Up till now, it ha hasn't said what it needs to say yet. Do you feel literature, stories, can help create this transformation in our human consciousness? I, I don't think, I, I cannot see anything else more suited to start this process of rethinking who we are and, and who the neighbors are. So, you know, it, we, we, uh, when, when I was in high school, my English teacher trotted out what was probably then a, a, a already a very, very old chestnut, which was there are three kinds of dramatic conflict. And of course, you know, we, we used sexist language back then. It was man against himself, man against man, and man against the elements, right? So you can have someone who has an unstable value system intrinsically that they, they believe very firmly in a certain value, but it comes into conflict with another value that they also deeply believe. How to resolve that? That's the classic psychological drama. How do I remain faithful but still honest? Right, as a, as a classic story. The other, the second order, is what happens when my perfectly defensible value collides with your perfectly defensible value, and there you have the basis of all sociological drama. How do you negotiate among different sets of held values when there is no external authority? The third, what happens when the desire 
and the need and the destiny of our, our entire species comes into collision with what the rest of the world can accommodate or wants to give, right? Something happened at, in the middle of the 19th century, or by the, certainly by the end of the 19th century, to make that third kind of drama disappear from our literature. I mean, you, we still have it, you know, in Moby Dick, for instance, but it kind of goes away after that. It becomes archaic, it becomes old-fashioned, it becomes like Jack London stories or something like that, where it, it's quaint. It, it seems quaint to us because we thought, we have thought for over 100 years that we won that battle. And there's nothing more to say about it except slightly nostalgic retellings of old stories. And what we're realizing now, week by week, month by month, I mean, I, I'm, I'm living in a place that has had more freak weather in the two and a half years that I've lived there than it's had in a hundred years before. We're learning every day that we did not win that battle or whatever we called winning is about to come and bite us in, in, in the rear. All right. And now I think because that, that, that potential source of drama comes back, we're gonna see a lot more literature rethinking this whole question about the human relationship to everything else that there is. It, for, for one, it changed your life, is what I gathered, really, practically speaking. Literally. And, yeah. and literally, yeah. yes, tell us about that. So I, I began the book when I was a press professor uh, at Stanford in Northern California in this very bizarre, uh, uh, I mean, almost, almost a, a Bunyan-like allegory for American possibility. I mean, it's, it's in Silicon Valley, right, Palo Alto. So that's the headquarters of Google and Apple and Intel and HP and Netflix and all the companies that have created the present and are in the process of manufacturing the future, right? Just on the other side of town were the Santa Cruz Mountains that had been covered in redwood forest that were, that redwood forests that were completely cut down in order to build San Francisco and to rebuild San Francisco. And it was my discovery up in these regrowing forests of, of redwood, of an uncut redwood tree that made me realize that I hadn't, I had never made this connection between what, we've, what we made and, and how we made it. And never, never really realized the degree of spending of principal and exploitation that went into creating Silicon Valley, no Redwoods, no San Francisco, no San Francisco, no Google, no Apple, right? So there was this odd, this, this odd uh, kind of uh, understanding about um, the relationship uh, in my local area. I then became obsessed with reading everything I could about these things that I'd ignored for 55 years. And as I was reading, I kept hearing that if you want to see what an eastern forest looks like, looked like, what an actual healthy, functioning, intact eastern ecosystem looked like, you have to go to the Great Smoky Mountains in southern Appalachia because it's one of the last remnant broadleaf forests on the continent. And I went there four years ago as part of the research for the book. And, you know, I've, I grew up in the Midwest and I've, I've lived in the east part of the country most of my life. And I thought I knew what my country looked like. I had never, I was wrong. I had never seen what my own patrimony, what my own legacy looked like until I went up into the uncut forest. It, you know, it looks different, it smells different, it sounds different. And there is a diversity and a, a, a health and a, and a wholeness to this, to this place that you can instantly feel as you move into it. And I, at the end of the research trip, I went back and spent the next seven or eight months unable to shake this idea of my feeling like a different person when, when I was there. And I, I ended up less than a year later going back and buying a house and I've been living there for, for the last almost three years. Uh, and in that sense, the book has changed where I am, what I see every day, how I spend my time, and 
it's also changed the pace and cadence of my days and my thoughts actually about writing and the utility of writing. And, then, and I, at, at this point in my life, I just as soon stop and pay attention and listen than declare anything, mm -hmm. right? I wondered about the writing about the trees, because you say, okay, I didn't write this from the standpoint from a tree, but there is a, the trees are very present, obviously, in this book. And you make them all seem different and almost personalities in their own right. Is it all in the looking, the way Mimi Ma looks at you towards the end of the book? She's one of the nine characters as well. She can look at someone right, for right, hours. Right. Is it that that gives you then the words and the ways to write a tree onto the page? Or is it a matter of research and finding technical descriptions? I suppose what I would say is that the research opened my eyes to what I wasn't seeing and the rest was simply practice. The rest was simply spending spending the time you know um in a in a sense the wellspring for all of this kind of american fascination with who else is out there um you could say you, you're not going to tell that genealogy without without mentioning thoreau right and whether or not, I mean, Thoreau's come under a lot of heat because his mother did his laundry and brought him sandwiches, and and right, it kind of it kind of lessens your sense that he's out there, you know, with, with direct and unmediated experience of 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 the woods. But actually, Thoreau wasn't really about going back to wilderness. He says at the beginning of Walden, he says, "I went to the woods in order to live deliberately." And that's all that this book is trying to say. It's trying to say we have to learn to live deliberately. We have to practice an attentional stance until we realize how deeply we've been colonized by the non-deliberate, by, by automatic processes, by the assumptions and, and uh, uh, consensual opinions by non-independent thought, yeah, one of the most correct. attractive that's correct. Uh, yeah. things in people, yeah. as one of the characters. That's says. right. Yeah. Time is flying by. I want to end our conversation here on this stage, but I can sense that even for all of you, this conversation is going to buzz on for <laughs> a long, long time. Uh, I want to go back to Patricia and read one more um, of her lines. She says, On the day the article appears, Patricia feels she has discharged her debt to the world. If she dies tomorrow, she'll still have added this one small thing to what life has come to know about itself. Is that how you feel about this book? <laughs> I, I, I wish I had the confidence in what I've done that she has and what she's done. Um, we wish you a very long and prosperous life, by the way. Thank you. Well, let, let me just say, and I don't, I don't know if this is an experience that resonates with you at all, but for a little bit, when you've, when you've done something that does change you and that you feel like, wow, I, I, I got somewhere that I, where I wasn't six years ago, you do have a momentary sense that you've discharged your obligation to the world, and you do say the rest. I'm, I'm, I'm. It's. A, I'm in the bonus round now. I can sit back. I can. I can hike. I can sit in the river, and and I'm done. And that lasts for about three weeks, and then then the voice says, "What have you done lately?" Right? I think I'm afraid there's a kind of writer's curse that you can never entirely grow out of, but at the moment, uh, I, I'm 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 very happy waiting to see what story this story takes me to next. We are all looking forward and very curious about it. Richard Powers, thank you so much for being our thank guest. Thank you, Annalise. <laughs>